All right, let's get into it, all right? Let's talk tonight about what your homework that I gave you last week. If you weren't here, that's okay. There were some folks that were here and they did their homework. So um, one of the things that I ask you to do is I ask you to look through uh, the book of Philippians and to, to look through and look over and look for uh, the theme of joy. Now, I told you to look for things like joy, rejoicing, those sorts of things. And I gave you a hint that it sh there should be at least 12 verses uh, that you see um, there. And so, uh, and then I ask you just kind of, in your, in your own words, kind of summarize what you think um, the theme of joy really is that Paul is communicating there in the book of Philippians. So, let's start. Who wants to start with the first one? Where was the first part you noticed, the first verse you noticed Joy or rejoicing? Okay. One, four. And what did you notice about uh, what Paul says there? Okay. It did, yeah. Always in every prayer of mine for, uh, for you all making... Uh, my prayer with joy. Yeah. What about the next one? What What's the next one you found? Okay. One eighteen, Philippians one eighteen, and tell me tell me what you saw there as you looked at and saw joy or rejoicing. Right. Okay. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. All right, what about the next one? Also in chapter 1, 125, all right. And tell me what you noticed, Jay, from 125. Yeah, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, right? So there, so it's not just that he has joy in prayer, but he has joy in the faith that is being, that not only his personal faith, but the faith that he, that is being carried on, the legacy of faith is being carried on through the Philippian church. Good. What about the next one? Okay, 2-2. Two, two. What'd you notice there, Rich? Yeah, so when Paul's looking at the Philippian church, man, he it, it brings him, he says, I have joy that there's unity, right? That there's humility and unity that exists within uh, the church there. It says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Good. What about the next one? What about the next one? is in 217 even if i'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith i am glad and rejoice with you all so paul is saying there even in i don't even know if i would say in spite of maybe in light of in light of suffering paul says that we can rejoice at our faith uh, and we we because Essentially, on the day of Christ, uh, he'll be poured out that his labor is not in vain, right? So that it, it basically what he's saying is, is that at, at the end of all of this, it, re regardless of how much I suffer in this world, I can have joy because I know, I know when all of this is done that everything that I put my life into for the glory of Christ, it, it will not return void, that there is reward and, and, and eternal joy awaiting him uh, on the other side. All right, so that was 217. What's the next one? <clears throat> there's, there's some more in, in chapter. Okay, you have two. So I heard 218, 228, and 229. Those are all, that's three of them. Yep. And so uh, in 218, uh, what we see there, 
Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. So he says to the Philippians, right? You should be glad too. You should rejoice too because we're all running the same race. It may look different, but we're all headed the same direction, right? We're, we're, we will all step into eternity. And if you have faith in Jesus, we all step into eternity with joy, right? And then 228, somebody, I think that was you, John. Tell me what, what did you see there in 228? Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Good. And then, Ms. Sharon, I think you said 229. At least I hope you did, because if not, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> yeah. So so receive him uh, in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. So. Okay. Sure. Good. Good. And then I heard someone say the next one I heard, I think it was Jay said 3-1. Yeah, right. Finally, my brothers rejoice in the Lord. To write this, the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you, right? So Paul says, man, I, rejoice in the Lord. I mean, that seems like a good place for us to find our rejoicing, right? Uh, what about the next one? It's all the way in chapter 4. Yep, four one. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. What do you think he... What do you think that what do you think he means by that? My joy and crown. That's an interesting way of putting it, isn't it? What do you think he means by that? Remember we talked about how words matter when it comes to Paul giving us the scripture. I mean Paul, but ultimately the Lord, right? So Okay? There's a sense of excellence. I would say absolutely it's a, it is an indictment in a good way of the character of the Philippians, right? But it's also Paul communicating basically and essentially, essentially to the Philippian church that, that, that they, are, they are a reward to him. They, they are the, the, cr- the crowning joy, right? That, that they, Paul has poured his life into the lives of a lot of these people uh, in the area, a lot of the people that are involved in the church in Philippi. And so when, he, when he's looking at them and he's looking at their faith, he, he says, man, when, when I'm looking at you I, and, and the way that you're living for the Lord, even though you got some problems and some issues, he says, in light of all of that, he says uh, that you are, that he calls them my, my joy, and his joy and crown. His, his, it's, a, it's a reward to him. I think that's an incredible way for Paul to put it. In, an encouraging way for Paul to, to put it, for sure. What about the next one, also in chapter 4? A very famous one, right? <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, verse 4, right? Um, that one, you really, it's, there's, not, there's not an explanation other than rejoice in the Lord. And uh, again, uh, always, and then he says again, rejoice. Uh, at the foundation of this, our joy rests in the Lord, all right? I don't want to get too much into that because that gets into this. <clears throat> Absolutely, <clears throat> right? He repeats it, right? He says it twice, and in the Scripture, if something is repeated, that's a clue, right? That's, a, that's an indication that, that this is something I really want you to take hold of. All right, and the last one, where is it at? Verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. 
He says, I, I, I rejoice, I have joy that you didn't have the opportunity before, but now you, you've, you have the opportunity and you're taking advantage of that opportunity to be there for Paul. <clears throat> the way it worked <laughs> when Paul was in prison is a lot different than when it, the way it works now. <clears throat> there was no commissary. You didn't put money on the books. Uh, and also, it wasn't three hots and a cot, right? It, meaning that you didn't get three meals a day and a nice cozy bed to sleep in. It was the only way that you received any sort of help and any sort of food is for people from the outside to bring it into you, right? So uh, when Paul's in prison, if it had not been for the generosity of the churches, uh, then Paul would have been in a really, really tough spot. But there were a lot of people, a lot of churches that were very generous uh, to him. Uh, because of his investment in their life and because he was a brother in Christ and, and uh, people served him in that way and, and the Philippians were a part of that. And, and Paul is thankful that, that they, they had renewed that. Now, let's talk about kind of the summary of joy in the book of Philippians. If I'm going to just can I, I'm going to kind of tell you my thought on it, and then you can see where you are, and you can share. If you want to share, you can. But the interesting thing about joy and rejoicing in the book of Philippians is that what Paul does is he, at the foundation of it, it's always Christ, right? It's always rejoicing in the Lord. It's always what the Lord has done. And then from that foundation, Paul builds a theology of joy that is... That is, it, it covers everything in life. And, and I literally mean everything. I mean the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? When Paul says, when I'm suffering, I rejoice and I have joy because, again, at the foundation of my joy is not this world. It's not what I have or what I don't have. But instead, it's, it's simply the opportunity God has given me to belong to Him. That's the foundation of Paul's joy. And so everything is born out of that foundation. And, and for Paul, that means that it wasn't the, the, the ideal Christian. It wasn't to walk around hanging their head in sadness. It wasn't, wasn't to walk around and, and have the attitude of Eeyore, right? Woe is me, like the sort of, oh boy. Like, that's just not the way that, that Christian joy works because it's, it's not anchored in this life. Now, if you have joy anchored in this life, yeah, you're going to live a pretty Eeyore-type existence where it's up and down, right? When you're on the mountaintop, things are good, and you find it easy to take hold of joy, but when you're in the valley, it's not so easy, right? There's, there's a real fleeting sort of perspective that you have on joy. But ultimately, what Paul communicates here and throughout the rest of the epistles that he writes, is that just like our faith is anchored in Christ, the joy that we have, the peace that we have, the hope that we have, all of those things are also anchored in Christ, right? That's why Paul would say something like, well, Christ is the chief cornerstone, right? The, he, Christ is literally the peace that holds all of this together, right? And, and, and I think that's what yeah, he's communicating even in the book of Philippians through this theme of joy. So if you have something different, it's, it does, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just kind of painting a picture of, in my mind, looking at uh, joy here and what, in the verses we've talked about, kind of what Paul communicates. But what, what about you guys? Did you have anything that you, about the theme of joy that kind of stood out to you or something that really spoke to you as you look through these verses? Anybody? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, that's that's okay. That's okay. It's not about my opinion on what on the theme of joy. It's about what the Lord is 
what the Lord moves in your heart as you read these scriptures, as you understand them, right? And again, we go, we, when we're looking at the scripture and studying the scripture, the thing that we've been talking about is we go as far as the scripture goes, right? And in, in applying the scripture, we go as far as the scripture goes. We don't go beyond that. And so, but getting to what the scripture says, the scripture says a lot, right? And the Holy Spirit may apply that to my life in a way that, and, and in my heart, in a different way because of the things I'm going through than maybe what you would be going through, right? God does that all the time. It doesn't mean that we're going beyond what the Scripture says. It just means that the application of Scripture, right, is, is very expansive. We just don't want to go outside of what the Scripture says in, a, in that application, right? And so I don't think we've done that. So we're in, we're in a, good, a very good place. So uh, let's, if, if anybody has anything else, now's your time. If not, we're going to keep on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. No, no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, that's interesting because you're right in that you have, you have Romans, you have, I mean, even in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, he, they, He's the the majority of First and Second Timothy. He's he's kind of an encourager, but but there's some really harsh things that he says in Timothy. But in the pastoral epistles, Titus, Timothy, and stuff like that, you do have this sort of the sort of softer side of Paul. But but in the and, and I would say in Romans too. But in the other text that Paul writes, you you do get a little harsher sort of. The, the Pharisee part of Paul where it's like I am of strict adherence to the law, right? And so what he does is he comes, the way that he comes at the church, like especially the Corinthian church, right? He comes at them really hard from, and he lays the hammer down on them because, well, frankly, it's not, dude, the Corinthian church didn't just have problem. They had problems and it was it was big, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like Ephesus. Ephesus has a false teaching problem, which you would think would be like the biggest type of problem. But when you look at it in comparison to for, in the Corinthian church, it's not even close, right? But, but, it, but it, that's the thing that we have to remember when we're reading through the epistles, right? That we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight. But we have to remember that there are occasions that, in which warrant a particular way of communication right and so it's, it's just like if you if I you and you'll find this out if you ever come to me for counseling sometimes I'm really nice and then sometimes I'm really not right sometimes um sometimes I will be very very kind and coddling uh, because that's what you need and sometimes um I will say to you well that was dumb right why did you do that right um that was sinful you know that's wrong. Why did you do that, right? Or I'll say other things uh, that you probably wouldn't like. But um, but it's 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 the occasion, right? We we look at the occasion that Paul's writing, and I think yeah, Philippians is definitely one of those times. The Philippian church has problems, right? But Paul spends very little time really hanging on to the problem. Instead, it's like okay, like these two ladies, you need to work your junk out, right? That's what, you need to work out your issue, but the rest of the time it is that there is unity and peace in the bond of Christ that, that when the gospel is going forth, which is happening in the Philippian church, even though they have problems, the gospel is going forth, and, and in that we find hope, and that we are encouraged, right? And so, yeah, you kind of see that, that different side, and, and I would encourage you uh, in dealing with uh, your pastor to remember what I just said to you, that sometimes... Sometimes it's good for me to speak very softly and kindly, and other times that doesn't work, and I may have to thump you on the forehead, right, to get your attention. So uh, just remember that <laughs> as, as we move forward. Um, when we've been working through this, uh, through studying the Scripture, what, what I have tried to do is I have tried to equip you with the tools necessary and at least 
with an understanding that would be necessary for you to open the Scripture, for you to read the Scripture, and for you to come to an understanding. Now, there have only been a few times, maybe three times, that I've talked about using outside resources. But even in those outside resources, the thing that I, that I have not encouraged you to do is to rest solely on those. And even the ones I have recommended are not really interpretive. They're, they're more helpful tools in getting to interpretation. But one of the things I do want us to talk about, and we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, later after we kind of talk more about uh, how do we understand the Scripture and genres of Scripture, but I want you to be cautious. And I say this to you because I've said it to myself a thousand times. Really easy for us to, instead of doing the legwork, instead of us opening to the book of Philippians and looking through verse by verse and, and asking questions and making observations, it's really easy for us to go online, to buy a commentary on the book of Philippians and to open it up and read it as gospel truth, right? It's really easy. And there are people that do that. There are pastors that do that, right? That's the way that they... Uh, that they do things. And I'm not coming down on that, but what I am saying is that we have to be really careful not to deprive ourselves of the joy and the spiritual maturity that comes with studying the Scripture for yourself. Right? I appreciate all of you guys being here tonight. I appreciate everybody who comes on Sunday morning, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that you will never get to a point of spiritual maturity in your life if the only interaction you have with the Scripture is on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night. It just doesn't work like that. We're not wired that way. right? We need daily renewing of our mind. Well, how does that happen? It happens with the Word, right? So we need to be actively participating in this walk that we have, in this relationship that we have with, with Jesus. I've heard it put a ton of different ways, but um, one of the ways is that you know, in a marriage relationship, it if you're not spending time together, if you're not getting to know each other, if you just get to know each other while you're dating, you get married, and then you just don't care about them for the rest of the time, your marriage is going to be very short, likely, or very unhappy, right? <laughs> and long and miserable, right? And so the, the same thing is true of our relationship with Jesus. If, if we think that God works in our heart through the Holy Spirit to draw us to salvation, and, and if we can just get these little glimpses of of him on church days or or what and through common grace in, in the world that that's going to be enough to drive us to spiritual maturity then we will live a long hard life full of a lot of doubt and a lot of questions right and so my encouragement to you is don't be afraid to pick up a commentary and look at what someone has to say about the scripture but my encouragement always to you first is for you to open up the Bible and work through these steps that we've been talking about for yourself, right? And, and, and I know that we've spent nine weeks or whatever it is kind of working through this process, but, but the truth of the matter is this is not a, for, for most of the time, it's not a nine-week process, right? A lot of the times this is a one or two hour a week process, Right? Because may, maybe you pick a, on Sunday, you pick a verse or a text or something that you're going to, or if you're studying for Sunday school, right? If you're teaching a Sunday school lesson, right? You know what's coming up. And so you begin working through this process and you work through it a little bit of, at a time, right? That, that's really what I've tried to push you toward as we've been working through all of this. And, and I hope that that's kind of where you, you are at and we live in a digital world and so I know that there are a ton of resources available uh, to you and I think you should take advantage of those resources but to remember that there is only one infallible and inerrant word that we have that is true all the time every time right and that's the word of God right commentaries are good the internet the Googles is good right the YouTubes right some of the stuff you can find on there, there, there are good resources there. But remember that those resources are not the Word. They are resources. They are given to you by, by fallible people, people who are capable of sin. 
who are capable of misunderstanding. And, and so remember that as you look to sort of other resources in the world. Now, I understand that part of the difficulty in reading the Scripture, and probably the, 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 the hindrance for most people, is that you read a verse of Scripture, you think about that verse of Scripture, or you think about that passage of Scripture, and then you say, I have no idea what this means. And so what that does in your mind is you say, well, if I've put all this time and effort into trying to understand the Scripture and I don't, then I'm just not going to try anymore, right? That, that's the way, that's what people do, right? If you don't believe me, go teach school, right? That, you have to encourage kids to keep pressing on, to keep remembering, to keep renewing and refreshing their mind with the material because for, for at least for a lot of kids, when I was in school, it wasn't that if you didn't get it once, you try, try, try again. It was, hey, if I don't get, this, if I don't get it once, I just move on to the next thing. Because I'm not good at this, but I'll be good at the next thing, right? And so, but that's not the way that we need to, our minds need to take hold of the truth of Scripture because it is so important to us. And so what I want us to do uh, for our time together tonight, for the next 20 minutes or so, is I, is I want to just give you, uh, kind of walk you through what it looks like to interpret and how we interpret principles for interpreting different genres of Scripture, right? And so I want to start with narrative. That's one of the things we talked about. Um, and, and here's the thing I'll tell you about narrative. It is not a good idea to try to interpret a story without understanding the broader context in which that story is being told, right? It would be unwise... For you to go to the story in Genesis 22, right? Abraham takes Isaac to the mountain to sacrifice him. It's unwise for you to go to Genesis chapter 22 and try to interpret Genesis chapter 22 if you don't know what happened in Genesis chapter 20 and 21, 19, 8, right? And it's also unwise to try to understand that story if you don't know what happens in Genesis 23, and following, right? So here's what I'll tell you about interpreting narrative. And I didn't come up with this. Uh, someone much smarter than me, Gordon Fee, he has a great book uh, called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And here's what he says. He says, when we're interpreting narrative, we need to remember that there are three levels. There's the, the bottom level, which is every single individual story that's told in the Old Testament. So every story ever told individually at the bottom level. And then on top of that, the middle layer is, the, is how that story fits within the history of the nation of Israel, right? So when we want to understand Genesis 22, we need to understand Genesis 22, but also how does that fit in the narrative of Israel's history? Because it is very important, right? Um, and then the, the next level to that, on top of that, is how does this fit in the grand narrative of God's story of redemption? Now, I picked Genesis 22 because that's an easy one, right? It, it, it's, it gives us a type, right? It, there's, there's typology there. It's pointing to Christ, right? The sacrifice of Isaac is a picture of the sacrifice of Christ. So that's how we understand it, right? But, but when we're looking at narrative, that's the way we need to look at it. We need to remember those layers in that if we're going to be interpreting a story in the Old Testament, we need to identify all of those layers so that we can understand it in the right way. All right. I would say that, that another prime example is not just Abraham, but David. If, if you really want to understand David, you need to understand his story and you need to understand his story in history, right? In the history of the nation of Israel. And then you need to understand the, the uh, importance of David in God's grand story that he's telling throughout Scripture that ultimately, again, points to the, the ultimate king of Israel, right? The Lord Jesus. So, again, I, I'll tell you this too about narrative. Uh, oftentimes, 
narrative does not teach doctrine, right? So it is unwise to go to a story in the Old Testament and try to bring out of that doctrine. Now, a lot of times what does happen is that narrative illustrates a doctrine, like the sovereignty of God in, um, in Joseph's life, right? It, uh, in the way that God works through the life of Joseph and God's sovereignty over that. So we have that. And let me say this, because this has been a big thing in, in the most recent years, is this whole weird, and this is not just progressive Christianity, but Southern Baptist, Baptist, the whole lot of people got really weird about this for some reason. And, and for some reason, people started reading the narrative as, okay, I'm, I'm reading something that happens in the Old Testament, and, and this is a good example for me, Right? A lot of times in the Old Testament, the, the narrative and the stories we have are not showing us the good examples, right? They're showing us the opposite of that. This is what you shouldn't do, right? The nation of Israel. Hey, all the other nations have a king. God, we want a king. God says, uh, I have, there's another plan I have for you. And they say, no, we want a king. God says, okay, got it. They get, it, they get a whole lot of kings that end up a train wreck. They also get a whole lot of judges that are also a train wreck. So it just ends up one gigantic train wreck, right? And so what do we learn from that? Not that it, well, not that if I say, God, this is what I want, he's going to give me what I want, because there are people that will say that, right? They, they, they wanted from God and God gave them. The problem is they divorced that from the rest of the narrative. And the rest of the narrative is, hey, God's way is the best way, because God's going to give you what you want, but what you want ain't always the blessings of God as a result, right? It's just it's what Romans 1 tells us, right? He gave them over. They, they pursued the passion of their own heart, and God gave them over to their debased mind, right? So, and then, uh, I'll, I'll say this too. In biblical narrative, God is always the hero. It's not you. It's not David. And so when we're interpreting narrative, we're not looking for us in the story. We're looking at God's story, and how is God the hero in this, right? Say that. The next genre is law. Now, how do we interpret the law? And I think this is probably one of the ones that, that Christians struggle with the most, right? How do we understand the law in its original intent by Moses, right? How do we understand it in the, the context in which it was written? But then also, how do we interpret it in light of Christ? That's where... There's a divorce, the great divorce between the conversation. Because a lot of the times we think it's just this sort of cold application, right? That, that God gave the law at Mount Sinai and then he extended, extends out the law even far beyond the Ten Commandments. And so, um, and so that's it. That, that's what we go with and, and that's kind of what we do. But, but let me give you kind of when we're looking at the law, two things. One, we should see the law as God's fully inspired word for you. We should, we should absolutely see it that way. But we don't see the law as God's direct command to us. Why, Eric, why do you say that? Well, how many times have you asked? I, I can't tell you how many times as a pastor someone's asked me, why do you feel about tattoos, right? And they'll go back to the Old Testament. And here's the thing about it. Is that the Old Testament law is the basis for the Old Covenant. That, that it's the basis for the Old Covenant. And so, it, it's Israel's history. But the Old Testament law is not binding on us in the New Testament because we're under a new covenant. It's a different covenant. It's the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the Old Covenant and what we have in the New Covenant. And so, that's why Jesus says, He, he quotes from the law, but, but when they ask, what are, what, is the, what are the greatest commandments, right? They have this huge law. They ask Jesus, what's the greatest? And what does he say? You love the Lord and you love your neighbor as yourself. That, that is the fulfillment of the law. And so what Jesus is doing is he's not cutting down the law, but what he's saying to them and what he does say is, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the old covenant, Right? And now we've been ushered into this new covenant. And so as Christians in this world, we're not looking back at the, old, at the law and saying, 
okay, well, how, how does this bind on me? But instead, we're looking back to the law and we're reading it. We're meditating on it. And, and, but, but we're meditating on it as those who are dead to, the, to that, right? We're, we're dead to that requirement, right? Why? Well, because Christ has already fulfilled that, right? So we're looking back at the law and we're interpreting it that way as a part of the nation of Israel's history and God in the old covenant, right? And so for us, we have to remember that Israel, for Israel, the law was the covenant stipulations that should be kept. It, it demanded, it had demands on the people of Israel. Absolutely it did as God's people. But that is not the way it works after Christ. It, it is Now, does that mean I should look at the Ten Commandments and be like, well, that, that isn't binding on me? No, that's not what it means. Right? Because everything wrapped up in the New Testament tells us that you shouldn't worship anyone except God, that you shouldn't steal, kill, covet your neighbor's stuff. Like, of course, right? Of course, those things aren't binding on us. Like, we're not trying to keep those things in order to get to heaven. But we also know that when God transforms us, by the gospel, that the desire of his heart is that we honor him, and a good way to honor him is, well, not to be a thief and a murderer and those sorts of things, right? And so it's not binding on us, but, but it still has value. We still meditate on it. We still look at it and look to it. It is a part of the scripture. Law. Prophecy is the next one. And what I told you about prophecy is that it's not always foretelling, right? It's not always talking about the future. That's the important thing about interpreting prophecy, right? That we have to remember that the majority of the time, prophecy is given in a context to that context, right? It's not meaning something way off in the future. Now, is there prophecy that is talking about in the future? Yeah. In fact, the majority of prophecy that we see that has a future application also has a uh, application in the time in which it was written right there there are many times where the prophets are talking about someone or something that's happening in their present day and age or that will happen in a very short period of time but also it is also applied to something that will happen in the future right and, and daniel is a good representation of that there's a lot of that in isaiah as well Right. So <clears throat> just remember <clears throat> that um, that prophecy ha can have future meaning, but it also has meaning in it in its present context. Right. So when we're reading the major and minor prophets, we need to understand what's happening in Israel's history. Right. To know how that's going to be fulfilled uh, during that time. In fact, <clears throat> someone once said, I don't know who it was, but. They said the best way to understand prophecy is like looking at a mountain, a mountain range from far off, right? So you, you see a mountain in the front, and then you see, and it looks like mountains are stacked on top of each other, right, when, as they go back. But, but as you get closer, you go to the top of the first mountain, and what you realize is there's miles and miles of valley in between that first mountain and the second mountain. But when you're standing far back, it looks like they're stacked on top of each other, right? The same way is true of prophecy, right? We, we have to remember we're looking at this from back here. And so it may look like these things are stacked on top, but we have to remember that we need to come up to the mountain and we need to understand what does this prophecy mean when it's written? And if it has future implications, what does that mean too, right? So it's kind of a dual uh, purpose interpretation when we're looking at it. The next thing is poetry. Let me just say this about biblical poetry. Is that... Biblical poetry communicates ideas, right? And I told you there's dualism a lot. It's like the, it says something in this verse and then maybe repeats it in a different way or something. There's not alliteration and all that stuff happening in biblical poetry. But uh, the thing about the biblical poetry is, there is there's usually purposeful metaphor in there. And so uh, sometimes what people try to do and what people get wrapped up in poetry is they try to over... Uh, over interpret poetry they they look at every word and they get lost in the words and not in the genre of the scripture uh of poetry and so remember that when you're reading the psalms yes there's doctrine 
built in to that. There's communication of doctrine. Absolutely, 100%. But also remember that you're reading something like David's lament over his own sin. And so uh, you, you have to be careful in how you interpret those things, right? Because there are people that things get really weird for people when, they're, when they start interpreting the Psalms in the wrong way. Uh, and you can come up with some, some crazy stuff. So just, just remember when you're reading poetry that you're actually reading poetry. All right? It's true. It's communicating absolute truth. But it's communicating in the form of poetry. The next thing is Proverbs. Proverbs, when we're interpreting them, we have to remember they are generally true statements. <laughs> now, they're the words, so they're absolutely true. But when I say that, what I mean is that it means w- the Proverbs give us true things that are true, generally speaking. Like if, it, you know, the, it, when it talks about wealth and things like that, right? If you, uh, if you give to the poor and stuff like that, then, then you'll have riches or whatever, right? That is generally true. But we should never go to the Proverbs and say, okay, well, this is always true, right? Every time, in every situation, this is always true. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to do these incredible things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be as generous as I can uh, and give and, and, and write all these checks to all these organizations. And then it comes around for a time for you to feed your family and you can't feed your family. You've, you've not fulfilled a proverb. You've been dumb about interpreting one, Right? We interpret them as general truths, not true every single time, right? So just, just remember that uh, when you're looking at Proverbs. The next thing is Gospels. Now, I'm just going to say this the best way I can about Gospels. Remember that the Gospel writers are writing to communicate uh, things about biographical information about Jesus, but they are not exhaustive, meaning that John even says, listen, there's, there wouldn't be enough books in the world for us to write everything that Jesus did. And so John says, I, I, he says, I'm writing that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by be- believing in him, you would have life in his name. So John tells us the reason he's writing. Matthew writes for a different reason, Luke for a different, Mark, all of them. They're writing for different reasons. And so we're reading them and interpreting them, interpreting them with those things in mind, right? Luke is a doctor. Right? So he's writing in a lot more technical Greek language. He's writing uh, things uh, in a way, <coughs> for Luke, it's, uh, it's communicating things of history like, like, like you would expect a history teacher right, to, to write things. Matthew uh, is writing from this, this tax collector. Right, He's a Jewish tax collector. And so he's writing, you, you will notice things in Matthew that, that he focuses a lot on elements of Judaism. And how that how they're coming out of that, right? And so, <clears throat> when we're interpreting the gospels, we need to be aware of each of the gospel writers and and, and look for the verses that tell us wh- why is he why is he writing this, right? Why what is he trying to communicate in this gospel? And it's it's there. Next thing is parables. When it comes to parables, um, the 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 best thing I can tell you is to. Um, Oh man, this is tough. Um, parables are difficult when it comes to interpretation. Um, but somebody much smarter than me said the best way to interpret parables is to um, to think of them like hearing a joke, right? And um, and that joke bringing out laughter in someone's life. Now, why why say it that way? Well. <clears throat> You have to have, in, in interpreting parables, you need to have a knowledge of, of what they're talking about, right? So, what do I mean by that? Well, if you are wealthy, and you go to the lost coin parable, and this lady loses a coin, and she tears her house apart to do it, a rich person is not, they may miss the reference point, right? Because for them, a lost coin doesn't matter how valuable it is, they just go buy another one, right? So you need to have that reference point, the, a knowledge of that reference point, and you need to be able to identify the unexpected turn in the story. That's what makes parables so difficult, 
is, is, okay, we need to understand the reference, and that's hard because it's so removed for a lot of us, right? Um, and so we need to look for that, the point of reference, the, the knowledge, and then we also need to look for the turn in the story because in every story there's a turn. We need to find out what that is, right? Of course, an easy one, Luke 15, right, the prodigal son. We, we, the que- well, maybe it's not so obvious. What is the turn in the story? You, you see how that could become quite difficult really fast because it would seem like there are a lot of turns in the story jokes on you there are i just picked that one because there are a lot of turns but you need to be able to identify those things right uh it becomes important but the next one is is epistles and uh like what we've been working through in philippians the the problem with interpreting epistles is is something that hopefully you can you'll you'll you have or you will pick up on is is looking at epistles is like looking it's like hearing one side of a phone call Right, we have letters. In fact, Second Corinthians, right? We have two letters. We know that from Second Corinthians, Paul wrote a third letter. Didn't it's not in it's not scripture, right? But we know that he wrote more than one letter. And so, but we only have we have one side of this thing. And so the 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 trouble with interpreting epistles comes because we have to do a lot of legwork to understand what's happening on the other side of this. And there's a lot of history that can tell us that. But there's a lot of things we can look to other books of the Bible even uh, to know what's going on. We can look to his, history books or whatever. But, but we have to be looking for that part of it. We have to say, I'm not just looking at one side of the conversation and trying to figure out what's happening. I, I'm looking at everything available to me to try to, to try to nail down exactly what's being addressed here, right? Um, it becomes important. And things like in books like Galatians, right, where there's there's issues between Jews and Christians about circumcision, and Peter's involved in some things, and Paul rebukes Peter and all that. Like you want to know if you you if you just read Galatians, you're going to know that Paul rebukes Peter, but th- there's no resolution really to that, and so you have to look outside of that, right, to figure out what what happened, uh, how was their resolution. So again, don't just Yes, we have, we have the most important side of the phone call, right? We do. We have the one God gave us. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be diligent in understanding it in the way that God has told us to understand it too. Um, when we come back next week, what we're going to do is we're going um, to work through some passages of Scripture together, and we're going to talk about interpretation, and then we're going to talk about whether the interpretation was good or bad. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. Uh, next week, and let me just, uh, for the sake of time, and this, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, the last of the ten strategies is what I ref- what I referenced in the beginning, uh, and that is consulting secondary resources, so commentaries and things like that. And the thing that I'll say, just like I said before, is just be wise, be wise, and don't don't let that become your sole uh, your sole means of receiving the truth of the word through commentaries, even if that commentary is preaching and teaching. You got to open the Bible for yourself, right? Look to the scripture for yourself. That's the only way you're going to learn. That's the only way you're going to mature in the faith because there's not always going to be a preacher or a commentary at 3 a.m. when your life starts falling apart. You can't say, hold on, I need to get on Google, right? I need to get on Google and find a commentary on Philippians because my joy is feeling real unjoyful right now because of what's going on, right? That's, that's just not always going to be the case. And so um, what I want you to do for, for next week is just consider all that we've done so far and then um, and, and how, um, how you can implement these things in, in the study, um, in the study, your personal study of the Scripture uh, as you move forward and, and as you work on um, what does it mean for you to understand the Word. Uh, for yourself. And then, like I said, when we start next week, we'll talk a little bit more about interpretation. We'll work through some of those things, and then we're going to talk about next week applying the word. So, uh, any questions, concerns? Yes.